The San Francisco Chronicle has a story, and the headline is two men with long criminal histories got caught for stealing bikes. What should San Francisco do about them? Now, I want to move beyond the particulars of that case to further down in the story, there is this. As of October 31st, San Francisco police had received reports of 810 burglaries or attempted burglaries this year in the jurisdiction of the Mission District Police Station, which includes the Castro area. That number marks a 13% increase from the 716 reported by the end of October last year. Police have dispatched more officers to the Castro and nearby areas to address the surge, fueled by a high-end bike boom and correlating with a drop in other forms of theft. The department also adjusted investigators' work schedules, enabling them to respond to crimes in the moment. Such measures probably helped in arresting Tiller and Howerton, police say, the two men arrested for the bikes. At the same time, residents and city leaders are searching for answers. Should they tolerate a high level of burglaries as a downside of city living and focus on barricading their homes? Should people who are repeatedly accused of stealing be targeted with rehabilitation services or incarcerated so they can't commit more crime? Supervisor Raphael Mandelman is frustrated. He's a longtime supporter of criminal justice reform whose policy views evolved as he grappled with property crime in his district, a persistent problem that makes residents feel vulnerable in their own homes. It raises tricky questions about incarceration, Mandelman said, because so far we've been unable to release Tiller and Howerton without them committing more crimes. And the question for reformers is, what do we do with someone like that? The Castro and surrounding neighborhoods are hot spots for burglary, in part because many of the homes have garages or basements where restaurants stow bicycles, an enticement for thieves because they're vulnerable and fairly easy to swipe. Now, I want to go back to a key paragraph. I want you to listen to this, digest this, process this. Residents and city leaders of San Francisco are searching for answers. Should they tolerate a high level of burglaries as a downside of city living and focus on barricading their homes? Should people who are repeatedly accused of stealing be targeted with rehabilitation services or incarcerated so they can't commit more crimes? The city of San Francisco is having an open debate within a newspaper and at large in the public over whether the residents of the cities of that city should barricade their homes to prevent crime as opposed to arresting and jailing the criminals. This is where we are in San Francisco. Do you know who came up with the idea of the city? Biblically, it was the very first murderer, Cain. Whether you believe that or not, there is a theology of cities, and it is inevitably not good. I've made that statement before, and a guy on Twitter flagged, Tim Keller, Reverend Keller, Reverend Keller, I, I'm sure you would disagree. Maybe you should comment on this. Tim Keller agreed. There is a theology of cities in the Bible, and it is not a good theology. The cities are where the bad things happen and the bad people live. That does not mean you can avoid the cities. It does not mean you should avoid the cities. You must go to the cities, Jesus himself, went to Jerusalem, and that is where he was murdered. The city is the invention of Cain, the man who murdered Abel, if you believe that. Whether you believe that or not, I don't care. I'm just putting that in perspective for you for the Bible. There is a theology of cities, and it is not good. There is a secular theology of cities, and it is very good. But the secular theology of the cities, of the secularists, is that people should move to the cities wherein they are more easily controlled 
and their lives can be fairly governed and dictated by government. The problem is that we've been in a global pandemic and city living was not really what you wanted during the time of a rapidly spreading virus. Cities are idealized by culture. And frankly, Republicans need to figure out a way to make inroads into cities. You know, Miami has a Republican mayor. There are not a lot of cities in which Republicans govern. Cities tend to be the hubs of progressivism and secularism, of atheism, of cultural rot. It is the city churches that have the pride flags and the fake gospel. It is the cities that have the wackadoo public policies to save the environment from the city dwellers. In Washington, D.C., there's a tweet that's gone viral of a man who is upset because a black couple has parked their car in a bike lane. The bikes could go around it, but he, the young white man, wants to lecture the older black couple that those lanes are for him now. They've gentrified the cities, and the black people, the progressive white people all love, they're the ones who are no longer able to live in the cities because the price of living in the cities has gone up. And eventually your city gets to San Francisco, where in San Francisco they don't know whether they should just barricade their homes and accept that crime's a thing or imprison the criminals. San Francisco is the theology of the city made real. It is a crime-infested third-world hellhole where people do drugs and poop on the streets. And the residents are so afraid of offense of anyone except the righteous that they would rather the criminals steal their things than actually throw people in prison. The Republicans, now we make it political, the Republicans should use this. They should not give up on the cities, but they should be mindful that the big cities, the metropolises of America, from New York to Atlanta, to San Francisco, to Los Angeles, to Chicago, they're probably not going to be governed anytime soon by Republicans. But it is the mid-tier cities where Republicans have opportunities. A friend of mine was talking about Texas, and you know, in, in Texas, you've got Austin and San Antonio and Houston and Dallas and Fort Worth and the really big cities, El Paso, that are that are uh, so dominant in the media's mind, but actually it's the Midlands and the Wacos. It's the smaller cities, the mid-tier cities that actually control the politics of Texas. And in those cities, Republicans have opportunities because in those cities, the cities and the suburbs are closely adjoined. And a lot of the suburbanites and the city people, they flow back and forth. And they tend to be more conservative than the metropolises. The metropolises, the big cities, they become pockets of hedonism. We see this in Atlanta now. An anything goes culture. And in that anything goes culture, the only thing that doesn't go is really righteousness, uh, conservatism, uh, sanity. In Atlanta, we see this with the bottle boys. So in Atlanta, if you come into our city, there are young men who have been standing on street corners selling bottles of water. There have been shootings. There's been crimes. There have been carjackings. And the city of Atlanta has essentially told the police not to do anything about it, and it's festered and gotten out of control. In Atlanta, the mayor of Atlanta has prohibited the police from chasing people, car chases. So in the middle of the night, drag races happen down the street in Atlanta, wake everyone up, because the police know they can't chase the people. This mayor was too unpopular and cannot run again and is on the way out. There are two people running, uh, Andre uh, what, Andre Dickens and the president of the city council, Felicia Moore, I think her name is. Uh, Mr. Dickens, for those of you in the Atlanta area who need to know, he's the only person running with private sector experience. You might want to consider someone with some private sector experience. If so, there's your man. The rest of us should look on this and see these are ultimately progressivism's failures. Progressives' failures 
tend to turn into crime-ridden cities. We should hope that none of our cities get to the state that San Francisco is in. But you got to understand that there's something underlying this, and this is where I want to dwell for a little while in this hour. There's a culture problem. It goes beyond the economic issues and the crime issues. There's a cultural issue with cities. Young people who have given up on God and worship themselves and their luxuries move into cities, drive up the prices, impact the poor negatively. The poor have to move out. They can't pay their taxes. There's their areas of their community. They get renovated and rebuilt and expensive and the young hipsters move in. Gentrification happens. And more and more of the people who love the city are left out of the city. And it's the people who want, who want to suck the soul of the city who are left behind. And Republicans need to really think about their answers to these problems because they're never going to now make inroads into these cities, but they can stop the left from corrupting more cities. Ultimately, though, you do have to keep in mind, it's a cultural issue. It is a theological issue. And I know a lot of you don't want to think about the theology of this, but just consider, has there ever been a city in Scripture that was really good? No, because there's a theology of cities and it's bad. It's the people in the rural areas that tend to be the people who tend to be the more culturally conservative, tend to be the more religious. You get into the cities and you get swept up by the luxury and the the, the culture of the city and it can rot your soul. I, I'm not against cities, but I think you got to be realistic about them and Republicans should be and those of you who are intrigued by cities should be aware that when you get there, those are where the progressives like to control you and put you in the subway system and take away your car and drive up your prices because in the cities, the left dominates. The problem for the Democrats is more and more people are moving to suburbia outside of the cities and the suburbs have decisively shifted back without Trump. They've swung back rapidly to the GOP and it presents not just a cultural dilemma, but a political one too.